This program is sponsored by Imagine Theaters, Able Ideas, Comic City, and Echo Network. Hey everyone, happy holidays and welcome to Comic Experience Sci-Fi. I'm Nick. And I'm Jill. And once more, we have a brand new episode for you full of footage we didn't get to show you this past summer. That's right, and we've got some great last minute gift giving ideas for the geeks on your list. That's right, I spoke with Level Up Dice from Australia at the Boston Comic Con, and they might have some options for the role player on your list. Hey everybody, it's Nick with Comic Experience Sci-Fi and we are at the Boston Fan Expo and all of you Dungeons and Dragons and gaming geeks, we have stumbled across a wonderful company called Level Up Dice and I'm here with Just Justice, who is the American manager, is that correct? So uh, Level Up Dice is an Australian based company. Uh, the owner, Alex, uh, he wanted to buy a set of dice for himself. He was wanted to treat himself and he couldn't find anybody that had the dice that he wanted. So he said, I'll just make my own. Uh, so that's where we came about, and that's where we started from. Can you show off some of your uh, most impressive products here? So this is one of our, uh, the ones that people come back to see. These are our caged dice. So these ones all start off as a full core aluminum dice. They go back into the CNC machine, and we cut it out little by little until that core falls free. So it's a fully independent core within a cage, but it's always been one unit. Uh, these are made out of uh, 6063 aluminum, 99.95% precise. We base it all on center of gravity. We've also got handcrafted semi-precious gemstones like our opalite right here. This is one of our uh, most popular ones because when you get a light through it, it just it lights up like a prism. And then the, the other big showstopper is the tungsten dice. I don't know if you can hear this here, but that's got some serious heft behind it. Now, wh how do the fans react when they come by and, and see all this stuff? We get a wide range of, uh, of reactions. You know, you get the, the drooling on the glass, all the way to the, the unimpressed, but secretly impressed. Like a true geek would. What do you think it is about the dice? Is, is it give a player something more to work with when they're playing the game? What is it about the dice themselves that are so appealing, do you think? So the dice help bring it all to life, right? This is, this is the tangible piece of a, of a theater of the mind game. Right. We find people that just collect them. We find people that love them for their beauty, for their material, but also the players that match every single one to a different character that they have. So we, we do our manufacturing. We source from all over the world for our stones and for our metals, and we're, we're constantly innovating, constantly doing new things. Like uh, for Gen Con, we released uh, tank dice. So we made them from a genuine piece of World War II tank armor. Well, thank you very much, Justice. Great talking to you. Joe Johnson here at LA Comic Con with the great Tori Belenci of Mythbusters fame. Let's talk about how you got involved with Mythbusters. How did you transition into that show? I was working for uh, Lucasfilm. So I was working on Star Wars, working on the Matrix movies, doing special effects. And then when Mythbusters started, they were just looking for people who could pretty much build anything. And that's kind of how I got the job. Did you ever anticipate the level of popularity that show would achieve? No, none of us did. I mean, we all we knew it was going to last a year. That's what we all thought. Okay, this is going to last a year. And then like 13 years later, you know, just every year it just kept going and going, getting bigger and bigger. You were involved in so many classic moments. I mean, I've seen every episode. From you trying to leap the wagon on a bicycle to launching a vehicle onto private property. What are some of your personal favorite moments? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're kind of, tomorrow I have a panel at uh, 10 a.m. and I'm talking about how I should be dead through from my career on Mythbusters. Uh, but I think one of my favorite moments on the show was when we blew up a cement truck with 800 pounds of Vampo. That was like, first time I ever was exposed to high explosives and then I was like, that's it, I'm hooked. It was crazy, we were all a mile away from the shockwave and about a second after the explosion went off, the shockwave hit us and it felt like somebody hit us in the chest. Well, talk about what it was like when you found out that you were going to part ways with Mythbusters. How did that affect you? You know, it was bittersweet. Like, we've been doing it for so long and we loved working together, but it was kind of like, this is the right time to see if we can do other things. And we did. We, we did a spin-off show for Netflix called White Rabbit Project. So it was, it, was, uh, it was good timing. 
talked about White Rabbit Project. What's that all about? So White Rabbit Project is a 10-episode show that Cary Grant and myself did, uh, and we're basically looking at weird stuff in science and technology. It's similar to Mythbusters, but very different at the same time. Talk about coming to Comic-Con. What is it, what is it like uh, meeting people who are fans? Of I love comic book conventions because it gives us a chance to talk to the fans that kind of were there for us through our career, and it's just fun just to see all the craziness. All right, this is Joe Johnson at the LA Comic Con for Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. Well, guys, that's it for the first portion of our show. Stick around for more Comics, Cheer, and Sci-Fi. <laughs> The magic of movies and more isn't just our tagline, we believe in its truth. A movie theater auditorium where wonderful stories unfold is a magical place. Whether a two hour film, a three hour epic, or merely the anticipation of viewing trailers, your every viewing experience is very important to us. Imagine's a pure Michigan company, founded and operated by Michigan natives. And moviegoers like you aren't just customers, you're our guests. So when it comes to movie going, we know you have a choice. And on behalf of our entire team, thank you for choosing Imagine. Welcome back to Comic Experience Sci-Fi. Jill, what other gift ideas do we have? Well, for all the naughty cosplayers, Q visited a company that specializes in replica weapons. Mm -hmm. Check it out. This is the Q from Comics Man Sci-Fi. I'm here at Michigan Comic Con in beautiful downtown Detroit. I'm here with Reed from Wolfgar Weapons and Props. How's it going today? Uh, yeah, we're having a good time here. Detroit's beautiful and we're glad to be here. So tell us about what you do here. I see a lot of different replicas and I'm still partial to the Tommy gun that feels so real. Uh, so tell us about everything that you do. Well, uh, we make a lot of film replicas. We make a lot of uh, cosplay props. We'll, we've actually had uh, some of the Tommy guns that you liked in like a Don, John Dillinger uh, documentaries and such. So, I mean, we, we do movies, we do cosplay, a little bit of everything. Up until about this year, we, we were mostly a cosplay thing, but we started branching out in the movies. Well, this year we've been in like six or seven different feature films, so yeah, it's been it's been cool. So is there a website that we can go on to purchase anything if you can't get them here at the con? Uh, absolutely. You can go on WolfgarWeapons.com. We have a storefront there, and we also have an Etsy, eBay, and Shopify if you just search Wolfgar Weapons. All right. Well, we'll be sure to check that out. Thanks. This has been the Q from Comics Man Sci-Fi. Hey, it's the Bradcast, and we are at San Diego Comic-Con at Source Point Press. I am here with Corin Nimick, the star of the upcoming movie, Rotten Tail. If it's not a spoiler for the movie, why is Rotten Tail rotten? Well, you know, really, uh, the, the, the lead character that it's based on, Peter Cotton, he's a, a, a scientist who was bullied heavily when he was growing up. And he works for a government lab, and he ends up being uh, bitten by, I'm, trun I'm truncating the story here, but he ends up being bitten by a mutated rabbit in, in one of the other departments of the laboratory. So he slowly, kind of like, uh, like the old Fly movie with Jeff Goldblum, he slowly mutates into a half man, half bunny, and he ends up going back to his hometown of Easter Falls to, uh, to kind of confront and get rid of the old bullies of his past who are now trying to bully the whole town. How was it making the movie? How did you like it? Oh man, the movie is fantastic. But the character, like you said, you know, a, a, a drunk half man, half bunny is just, it was so much fun to play. And uh, and it looks absolutely amazing. The director, Brian Skiba, he did such an incredible job bringing uh, this graphic novel by Source Point Press to life. David's a close friend of mine. We've been together buddies for 12 years. and. Uh, he called me and said, hey, I've got this comic book. We want to do a film out of it. I said, okay, let's do it. So he and I started working on a script, got it put together, got the money, and went to work. Very challenging with uh, with all of the makeup, with the prosthetics and everything. We did about an hour and 45 minutes every morning to put all the makeup on, and then an hour and 15 minutes every night to get it off. Yeah, it was something else. Uh, such a fun character, though. I wish I had brought the teeth with me. So Corin's mask was actually two pieces. He had a cowl that went over the top of his head, and then the prosthetic that glued onto his face, and I think it was yeah. multiple actually. So they they would keep the they keep the headpiece, and I'd reuse the headpiece, uh, you know, about six or seven times, and then and they, they but they tear off the facial part, and you do a brand new one every single day, and then by by about day seven or eight, they switch to another headpiece to keep it looking fresh and everything like that, so that it doesn't start getting too deteriorated. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. This has been a broadcast. 
We'll see you next time. Hey, this is Mark. I'm here at the London Comic Con 2018. I'm here with Dean Cundy. Now, some of you might not be familiar with his name, but I know you're familiar with his work. He is the director of photography on films like Halloween, The Thing, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, the Back to the Future trilogy, and Jurassic Park. How you doing, sir? Very well, and yourself? I'm doing great. Now, I'd like to ask you, now, the, when you worked on the film Halloween, you were like the elder statesman on that crew. Like, everyone else was much younger than you. How did, what was it like working on that film with these, like, amateurs, you might say? Well, actually, I'd have to say I was just about the same age. We, we had, um, um, I, I had done maybe like 12 low-budget movies, but uh, one of the uh, crew people on it was Deborah Hill on the various movies. And uh, one day she called me up and she said she was working with this uh, young guy um, and uh, they wanted to make this movie about killing babysitters on Halloween. And uh, she said she thought that he and I would make a good team. And I said, oh, what's his name? She said, well, John Carpenter. And uh, that's how I met John. And we all went on this, uh, this adventure together of making Halloween, the first one. So and then you became his favorite cinematographer from there on in pretty much for like the, the most of his best work. Ah, well, I like to think of it as his best work. Uh, yeah, I did five films with John. Um, each one more interesting and, and challenging than the one before, uh, which was, I think, the, the thing about working with John is it was, it was never the same. He was always looking for a new uh, way to tell a story, um, new visual style, uh, all of that. So it was, it was a great adventure working with him on these uh, films, each one more challenging than the one before. People like you need to come out to these conventions so we can come and talk to you guys because we love DPs, we love directors, writers. We just love the whole film process. You guys need to be presented more here, here at these shows. It's a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Cundin and Cundy, and uh, have a good show. Well, it's time for another break. Stick around for more Comic Experience Sci Fi. That's my line. We'll be back. Okay. Stop what you're doing and come check out how we do things here at Able Ideas Comic Book Production Company. There we got your attention. Now go to our YouTube channel to subscribe and follow us on social media. Stay tuned for our uncensored DVD coming soon. And for more information, follow us at ableideas.com where your ideas come to life. Welcome back to Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. No Geeks list would be complete without comic books or graphic novels, including some of the indie titles. That's right, and Casey got a chance to talk to a company, Aspen Comics. Let's check it out. Hey, Comic Book Casey coming at you from Comic Spear and Sci-Fi. We are at the San Diego International Comic Con, and I'm currently hanging out with the artists and writers at Aspen Comics. So let's talk about your current and latest and greatest project. So I'm Jordan Gunderson. Uh, I came out with this book called Dissension War Eternal. Uh, it's my creator-owned property I've been working on for a really long time. It's basically a kind of fantasy sort of it's it combines a bunch of different genres it's really hard to, to kind of classify it as one but it's i'm super excited to have it out there chris is the writer on the book and we collaborated writing it together and then i'm the artist on it so what about you chris this is my first book with aspen so i'm really, really excited to be a part of the team and uh see this come to light it's been a great experience nothing like that fresh new ink smell of your own project coming out right all right guys so why don't you tell us about your project what did you do here with aspen comics uh, my name is Alex Conant. I've been working with Aspen for almost 10 years now, and we're currently working with JT Chrome. 
on a new project called The New Way. So, uh, New Way is kind of a futuristic adventure about uh, a mixed martial arts fighter uh, named Si Hao who's ready to go to the next level and get cybernetic enhancements so he can fight on like, the big arena battles, but he's not sure he really wants to sacrifice part of his body. So it's kind of this all, whole notion of uh, living in a world of technology and trying to maintain our humanity in it, but it's, uh, it's a really gritty kind of uh, action-oriented story. Uh, Alex says we've been working with him for years, we worked on Soul Fire together, uh, worked on Minefield together, also here at Aspen Comics, uh, and he's got an amazing uh, naturalistic style that just really, uh, really brings this story to life, so really excited to be working with him again. How long have you been with Aspen Comics? I've been with Aspen almost since the beginning, pretty much. It's a, actually, it's a great year for Aspen Comics. It's their 15th anniversary. It's the 20th anniversary of Fathom, which is their flagship property created by Michael Turner, and the 15th anniversary for Soulfire, which is the other uh, fly, uh, main title at our uh, company here. But it's we're an independent publishing company. We do uh, a lot of great stuff. It's all our own stuff, all created in-house, working with artists like Jordan and Alex. And we're really kind of a, a family environment. You know, we all kind of just kind of carving our own path in this industry together, so it's a really exciting time for us. Hey guys, it's Nick and we are at the Fan Expo in Boston. I'm here with Britt, a cosplayer. Britt, is this your profession, a cosplay, or is it just a sideline of other modeling you this do? It's my day job. Really? Tell us how you got into it. So about four and a half years ago, one of my friends suggested like, hey, why don't you dress up and go to cons? And I'm like, people dress up and go to cons? What are you talking about? And then he explained to me Comic Cons. I've been playing video games since I was like three. I grew up on Star Trek. Picard's the man, you know, so that I grew up in all of it. And then I'm like, wait a minute, I, I can I can put on costumes and nobody's going to make fun of me. Right. So then I put on a costume and nobody made fun of me. I'm like, heck yeah, done. What, what was the first costume? Tifa from Final Fantasy VII. OK, so what's a typical gig for you? I had this right here, you know, sitting here, getting to meet people who have seen me make costumes, who have you know, appreciated my work and getting to talk to them about it and talk about their fandoms and my fandoms. That's a that's a typical gig. So you make your own costumes. What what are some examples of some other costumes you've made? I've made uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's Catwoman from Batman Returns, which is probably my favorite. I've made Pokemon. I've made other video game characters like Bilgewater Katarina from League of Legends. I've done a Luigi, actually. It's like a super cute, like, you know, high heels and everything. Because um, if Luigi was a girl, that's what I think she would look like. Yes, yes. And so now do you get called to do gigs where you're asked to play a certain character or do you just pretty much go around to these kind of events dressed as characters? I mostly go dressed as the characters. I like to fancy myself more of a maker than maybe the player per se because I enjoy the crafting part of the costume. I like sewing. I've been doing it since I was 12. So for me, that's my zen. I like making the character, not necessarily acting like the character. Okay, so you mentioned that the Star Trek is on your to-do list. Do you have a specific character that you're gonna that you want to play? I just don't want to be a red shirt because I don't feel like dying. Right. So uh, I'm thinking more blue. Okay. Because you know. But an original series character, you're yeah, saying. Pretty you, much. But you're a next generation girl. I know, but hey, I can evolve too. That's true. But that's isn't that devolving though? <laughs> we'll just fix it all together. I love it all too. Fun. So I, okay. Thank you for talking to us. Appreciate. it. Have a great Thank show. You. Thank you. This is the Q from Comics Man Sci-Fi. I'm here at the Michigan Comic Con, the first ever Michigan Comic Con in downtown Detroit at Cobo Hall. And I'm here with Joe, the creator and builder of Optimus Prime. Well, I can't say I created it, I just replicated it with the help of a lot of people. But yes, I am the one who spearheaded this entire build. He's so modest, just like Optimus, so modest, so modest. So tell me, how long did it take you to create, well, replicate? Optimus. There were several stages involved, you know, when it comes to the custom mods, the paint and the chrome and all that, that took about four to five months. There's a team of maybe 25 people or so. The truck itself is a Western Star that was actually built by Western Star's factory to become Optimus, so that build took about three months. We chose to get legal permission from Hasbro, so that took about two months to do. So I'd say the whole thing was generally about a year from start to finish. I'll take it you're a movie fan more than the cartoon fan because you chose to do the movie replica? I am an Optimus Prime fan because I love his morals, his character, everything about him, a natural leader that you just want to follow. I love the way he inspires. I mean, just the truck sitting here, you have no idea how many people it inspires and how many people come up to me and said, you just made my day. I saw Optimus Prime. I mean, just the character alone is, is really the main reason for doing it. Plus, this is something that no other fan in the world has ever done. I'm the only person in the world to replicate this truck. There's only two others like it, and those are the ones that are owned by uh, Daimler, I believe, that were used in the actual movie. So this was all kind of an impossible dream scenario for me, and it was my way of inspiring my son, who's 10 right now, 
to pursue his dreams and not be afraid to try. Do you go around the country? Do you drive it? Is it drivable? We travel pretty extensively with it. We do drive it from point A to point B. It's never trailered. I wish it would be trailered sometimes, but <laughs> the biggest part of that is cleaning it when you get to a destination. It'll take me five, six, seven hours to clean it. Uh, the bugs wreak havoc on it, but you know we go to a lot of comic conventions, truck shows. We've been to children's hospitals. Uh, we used to pick up kids from school, prize people at their workplace. Which one was your favorite movie? Personally, I love Days of Extinction. I know there's a lot of people out there that hate the movies, and they have no problem telling me how much they hate this version of the movies. But you got to keep in mind, you know, it's keeping Transformers alive. It's keeping the franchise alive. I mean, it's been since early '80s. I agree with you on that one. Thanks for your time, and this has been the Q from Comics Man Sci-Fi. Well, we've got one last commercial break, but stick around. We'll be back with more Comics Beard Sci-Fi. Welcome back to Comics, Beer, and Sci-Fi. So, Jill, what do we have for the gourmet geek on your list? Well, I talked to a gal that makes you super looking while you're cooking. Mm -mm. Well, I am here today with... Sonia. And she makes... I make nerdy oven mitts. And? And aprons and bags and practical things. So you mix comics and cosplay with everyday items that you can use. What inspired you? So I actually started because I, I would make my own dresses and people asked me to make them dresses. And two people with the same size are not necessarily the same shape. So I was like, what can I make that will like work for everybody? And I made an oven mitt and I posted it online. And this was like two and a half years ago. And someone was like, I'd buy that. I was like, maybe I'll think about that. And uh, it just like grew from there and now that's all I do. Like I quit my day job and now all I do is make oven mitts. So you do aprons, oven mitts, I see some bags here. Do you do any other clothing items or do you stick with kind of like the household conventional items? So I try to stay with like kitcheny stuff. I added the bags recently, like very recently, like a, less than a month ago just to see how they do and now they're taking off too. So these items are so beautiful. Now how long does it take about for you to make one and how much does one cost? So, well, for the mitts, I do them in giant batches. I'll get the fabric quilted in, like, one long piece, just cut them out. I used, if I do it, like, one by one, like, I don't know, 30 minutes for one. But but I, I crank them out, like. How much can I buy one for? So the mitts are 18 each, two for 35. My aprons are 35. They're double-sided, and there's pockets on each side. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Sonia. I cannot wait to try these out. Hey, this is Mark at the London Comic Con. I'm here with Steve Horst. He's head of the Southwest chapter of the Doctor Who Society of Canada. How you doing? I'm doing great. So tell me, uh, what is your goal here today at the London Comic Con? What are you trying to achieve? For uh, London Comic Con, we're raising funds for the uh, London Children's Foundation, which is a children's hospital here in London. This is what the goal of the Doctor Who Society of Canada is. We raise funds nationally uh, for various children's hospitals around the country. Tell me, you have some pretty cool props here. You have some Daleks, you have the B Bessie and the TARDIS. Yep. Uh, how did you guys come across all this cool props? Uh, these are all built by the uh, members of the group. Um, the TARDIS was built by uh, one individual and so is the car. He, that's a, an actual Bessie replica kit that uh, came straight from England. The Daleks are all built by the owners. They are fully functional. We get in them, we uh, 
go out and exterminate people, but it's all for a good cause. <laughs> the baby Daleks have taken over the asylum. Exterminate. Exterminate. You must be a big fan of Doctor Who, obviously. Now, this is an exciting time for the show, being having the first female Doctor Who. What do you, th what do you think about that? I think it's great. I think it's a great opportunity. I think it's a great spin on the show. It's a, ref it's a refreshing take on the show. I think it's great. Do you guys go to all these other different Comic Cons, or is this like you're like one of the first ones? We do do most of the Comic Cons around, yeah. We uh, go from as far west uh, in Ontario as uh, Windsor, and we go all the way to Montreal. That's pretty cool. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you, Steve, thanks so and thanks. Yeah. This is Mark from the London Comic Con. This is Richie Rollins from Comic Experience Sci-Fi, and I'm standing with an animator and director who is responsible for many of my favorite Saturday morning cartoons, Mr. Tom Cook. How are you doing today? Hey, really good. What was your first gig? The Challenge of Super Friends at Hanna-Barbera. That was back in 1978. From there, you blossom with Hanna-Barbera, basically. I worked on like Scooby-Doo and the Flintstones and the Jetson movie and a bunch of different things, Godzilla, Smurfs, and then uh, Hanna Barbera sent all the work over to Japan and Korea. So I was scrambling like crazy to find work and I ended up working at Filmation because he had promised not to send work overseas. And that's when I got into He-Man and She-Ra and Brave Star and Ghostbusters and a bunch of different things over there. Do you have like a favorite one that you've done or? Yeah, I was just talking to somebody about it. It's this one right here, Thundar the Barbarian. Uh, I did that at Ruby Spears. That was actually between Hanna-Barbera and Filmation. And it's, uh, if you know Jack Kirby, he was one of the creators of the show. So it was really like one of the best shows, I think, uh, of that era. Was this like a childhood dream of yours? You know, I always wanted to draw. I took a class in comic books and the teacher worked at Hanna-Barbera. And he saw my work and he said, we have a lot of people that can draw Fred and Barney, but they don't know how to do superheroes. And your artwork is really nice, the superhero work you did. So I could recommend you to Hanna-Barbera to get a job as a, an animator, assistant animator. And I, I couldn't believe it. I was a bus driver at the time, transit bus driver. And three weeks later, I was working in Hanna-Barbera. Uh, do you have anything you're working on now or for the future? Well, this is kind of what I'm doing now. And it's really humbling to know that I had a part in really changing some people's lives. I had somebody from, uh, from Chile that said that He-Man was so influential in his life that it kept him away from the gangs and the trouble. He was crying, talking to me, telling me this story. I mean, geez, touch your heart, you know? So I, could, I didn't believe that He-Man could make that big of a difference in somebody's life. You draw superheroes, you create superheroes, you are a superhero, my friend. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Comic Experience Sci-Fi, but we have another brand new episode for you next week. And from everyone here at Comic Experience Sci-Fi, we'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Fa la 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 la.